what about the other fact then, many of these patients, uh, if you're 50 years old and you're working, coming in then for infusions every two weeks or every three weeks, and depending on how you do that, versus taking a pill at home, does that impact on your decision then of one treatment versus the other in terms of... Uh, um, sort of practical, practical reasons, Mike? Yeah, sure. So it's a very important issue because the immune therapies that we're talking about, ipilimumab and nivolumab in combination or single agent PD-1, these are all intravenous treatments, and all the BRAF and MAC combinations are oral pills. So one would think that perhaps it might be easier to take pills at home, and I think initially perhaps that may be the case that the patients get the pills and they take it at home and they come in to just see how they're doing. So that may factor into it a little bit. But I think the other thing that we need to keep in mind, at least with combination ipilimumab and nivolumab, is a lot of patients do discontinue treatment after just a few infusions, after achieving response, particularly in the setting of toxicity. And after that response is achieved, the side effects are managed. Many of those patients are not on ongoing treatment longer term. And so, yes, it is more involvement with the intravenous immune therapies up front for the first couple of months, or at least certainly the first few weeks of coming in every three weeks. But if they've had toxicity that precludes ongoing immune therapy and they've achieved a response, once you've managed their toxicity and they're feeling well and they're in response, they may just be coming back every three months getting scans and those patients continue to work. You've gotten them through that acute period and there is something to be said for that long-term PFS that you can get from that approach with very short durations of treatment in some mm. of these patients. Well, we guess we really don't have data on that long-term PFS for these patients yet, though, at this point in time. We are working on that. We have seen that clinically, but that's exactly right. We don't exactly have the specific data. We do know that in some of the published randomized trials, including the phase two Checkmate 069 study, only about 40% of patients went on to get any dose of nivolumab maintenance after that first three-month induction period of combination ipilimumab and nivolumab. So more than half the patients aren't going on to the maintenance phase. And so 60% or so of patients are only getting treatment for three months. And yes, that is a more involved three-month period and maybe another month or two of side effect management subsequently. But if you think about the long time that many of those patients will be off of treatment, that is also something to consider. So it's not quite so simple, although I do agree that initially it is easier to start taking pills and coming back for treatment. But we have to think about this in a longer term setting because we fortunately have a lot of patients who are doing well longer yeah. term. So just coming back to this question about, again, can we actually figure out for a patient who presents, is there something that tells us that it's right to start with targeted therapy or right to start with immune therapy? And again, I think what we're sort of now observing as we look at trials and look at clinical features is, again, there is this question about is there overlap of clinical features of patients who do well with targeted therapy, patients who do well with immune therapy. What's also going on is many investigations of molecular and immune markers and their correlations with outcomes. And uh, what's really interesting is, is that some of the markers that have been looked at with immune therapy, such as mutation burden, which seems to be associated with a higher chance of responding to immune therapy or responding longer, or again, as, as Dr. Rebus was talking about, seeing evidence of an anti-tumor immune response with a T-cell infiltration, Interestingly, there is now early data that those same features also correlate with better outcomes with targeted therapies as well. That again, this overlap of which patients do and don't benefit may not only be for clinical features, but may actually be for molecular and immune features as well. So again, as we're moving forward and doing clinical trials and doing research, we're really starting to take now more comprehensive approaches for each of these patients and each of these therapeutic modalities. That's important to look at both the molecular biology and the immunology when we study both targeted therapies and immune therapies. So Mike, so and I think that those are you know, very important uh, topics for us to understand as we move forward with this to try to really find the best treatment for the patient with the uh, um, highest degree of response and durability of the response with the least amount of toxicity for the patient though. But practically right now though, if we look at this is that those, features, those studies may not be available in the community at large. So are the clinical features then that you would look at in terms of if this patient came in, if they had fatigue, they had bone pain, it, and they also had what appeared to be a very rapidly progressing disease, are you then more likely to choose one treatment over the other, and how, how do you assess that? Yeah, so again, and it, it is sort of the great question, and again, it is that debate of is the uh, clearest emphasis on being able to get the disease under c control initially. Um, and again, I think that in a BRAF mutant patient, your highest chance of getting a response is with targeted therapy. And so again, for those patients who present 
with symptomatic disease, with threatened organs. And I would say the other place that I particularly, again, think about the targeted therapies is when we see patients with brain metastasis, yeah. where you don't really sort of have a lot of, of room for sort of tumor progression before you start getting into very serious problems. Again, we're still just learning now about how, how well immunotherapy can work in patients with brain metastases. We've had data with ipilimumab that showed it actually worked relatively well as long as the patients didn't require steroids to control cerebral edema. Um, the data that we have with single agent PD-1 therapy again showed that patients with brain metastases could respond, but it was only tested in patients again who didn't require steroids. Many of our patients are requiring steroids to control cerebral edema for brain metastases in those situations. Again, I think that targeted therapy would then be something I would go to before immune therapy. But again, brain metastasis is also a, a, a place where we have sort of a multidisciplinary evaluation of the appropriate initial therapy because there's also options with radiation therapy as well. And how do you decide between those then? Are there certain parameters where you would decide for a patient that you should do radiation first or do you have some time, some, some runway to, to do either um, and uh, PD-1 therapy or BRF MEK combination if they have a mutation for those patients. How, how do you decide that yeah. practically? And, and again, coming back to Tony's point, this is again where we're all sort of, you know, going with the best data that we have and, and as I think Dr. Pasto said, really a gestalt. Um, certainly, I think for a patient who presents with brain metastasis in the setting of, of widespread, uh, you know, clinically significant extracranial disease that's causing symptoms, the best way to sort of address both of those problems quickly at the same time is starting with the targeted therapy because, again, it has a very high chance of controlling the brain metastases as well as the extracranial disease. It is an interesting question for those patients with lower burden of CNS involvement of whether or not it's right to go with that approach.